Uh, you really mustn't, darling. I... All right. Can I comment episode number two? where we're just talking in just little bites about just different things we see, read, listen to that um, we want to comment on or bring our perspective to. So uh, this one, it's no, I mean, anyone that knows anything about the Christian world over the last couple of years knows that in every denomination, every vertical and stream of ministry, a massive leader has fallen, right? Um so somebody tweeted this today. This is somebody who's a part of a church planting organization said this. My suggestions for killing celebrity church and pastor culture. A church should be no larger than 150. Instead of growing larger, send more out. Stop building notoriety off sermon podcast off of sermon podcasts. No lead senior pastor roles, only polycentric pastoral teams and no church franchising. So before going through some of what I thought were the good responses to this, what would your initial thought on that be? My initial thought is that this person is having a reasonable reaction to um, well, some of the things that have come to the surface mm -hmm. and you know, leadership failure and moral failure, um, but that they haven't necessarily thought through all of their conclusions. Um, maybe from a biblical standpoint, but mm -hmm. also just logically. Right. Um, now they are putting it forward as their suggestions. So, right. you know, they're not saying this right. is gospel, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with all their conclusions. I have found myself thinking and, and asking uh, questions in my own mind, you know, specifically with, um, with the stuff surrounding Hillsong and, and Brian Houston. Um, is there a certain point where like it's just too big mm -hmm. for one person? Right. Not that he's the one person. Obviously, he's got a team and and all that kind of stuff. But um, I think it's natural to ask these kinds of questions. These kinds of questions. None of us want to fail. Right. None of us want to fall. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, none of us want to see other people. Right. Fall. That's what I think is really interesting. Right. Like, and, and not to get into that specific thing, but you know, like something it happens every time. A big time pastor ministry leader falls. Mm -hmm. You have one part of the church world that wants to talk about it till they're blue in the face. Mm -hmm. And then you have the other part of the church world that doesn't want to like say any actual names. They just want to subtweet verses about character and longevity and <laughs> pretend like they're doing it in a right. Um, but it really does. It opens that up. And I think for whatever reason, this one has like really struck a chord mm -hmm. as it should, mm -hmm. as it, it makes a lot of sense. So he says this. And that was kind of my first thought was like, oh, I think we're being a bit extreme here. Yeah. like Because example, that's assuming that only churches with over 150 people yeah, can I, have bad leadership well that's 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 what i mean by illogical right um and unbiblical in the sense that nowhere in the new testament is there a prescription for how large a congregation should be yep um i mean i even think this is an old testament example but like when jethro gave moses advice mm -hmm. he certainly didn't limit those leaders at 150 right i think you had like leaders of a thousand and you know, on down from there so um i don't think that that's a logical conclusion and to your point you know, having a church of 150 people does not make you immune to right all kinds of right failure. One of the one of the great responses was, "So, how does this church of 150 people pay for the?" In fact, can polycentric. I just, yeah, go ahead. Can I just say one thing? I would say, if anything, if um, if somebody who has a uh, if somebody has a gift to grow a church beyond 150 people, mm -hmm. um, and well, let me come back to what I was going to say then. But if someone has a gift to do that, uh, then it will actually be unhealthy for the church because they will, rather than doing the natural thing of delegating and mm -hmm. empowering people mm -hmm. and divesting their power, mm -hmm. giving people authority to lead, they will be overly controlling. Right. And that, that will produce bad outcomes as, as well in well. an unhealthy culture. Right. Growth happens. To me, this person sounds like they don't understand how healthy growth happens. Right. Healthy growth happens by the giving away of power right. um, in, inside the organism of, of a church. And so um, I just, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you can solve that problem by sending out churches sure. and church planting. And yep. I think church planting is an absolutely necessary thing. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that there's something to be said about like 
th there has been, I think, in some instances, like an empire kind of mindset. Yeah. Um, in in evangelicalism, uh, that is uh, not a healthy thing. Um, but somebody can seek to build something significant without being motivated by having their own empire. Right. Um, I think it's more nuanced than that. Mm -hmm. Like for us, for example, we plant locations of our church. I have absolutely no desire whatsoever to have like, I don't have a global takeover plan. Right. I don't want to plant a church in every major city. Mm -hmm. I don't want my name to be known mm -hmm. by Christians in every major. I yep. don't want that whatsoever. What I want to do is what God wants us to do. Right. And I know that, you know, that can sound like a, like a Christian trope. Yep. Um, and so you just have to be in our community to kind of discern whether or not that's what we're doing. Right. Um, well, that's, what's hard, right? Some it, it's, I think it's a really false assumption to assume that anyone who has a global takeover mentality has anything but pure attentions in the first place. Mm -hmm. Right. It's only until that bears out. Do you know if someone's intentions are right or wrong mm -hmm. yeah. you know like it, it's really easy i mean at least that's my initial thought because mm -hmm. and, and i'm the guy that always tends to be like roll my eyes at the sure super over ambitious but i think something i'm always challenged with is like who am i to judge mm -hmm. why someone is doing something mm -hmm. um and i think it's a it's a false assumption to say that everyone is just trying to build something i think this person is trying big, to right? they're trying to be prescriptive when they shouldn't be being prescriptive mm -hmm. um at the end of the day god has different graces for different people mm -hmm. uh so far, God has graced us, you mm -hmm. know, to to lead a church of um, more than 150 people, mm -hmm. and I feel pretty healthy. Our church feels healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yep, you know, one good response was, "How is this church of 150 people going to pay for uh, this polycentric pastoral team?" <laughs> That's a great question, which I thought was really good. <laughs> and the response was, "Well, they won't. They'll all be volunteer." Right. And then the response was, "Wait a minute." hold on, let's look at the scripture that talks about the people that preach their gospel for yep. a living should make their, their yep. living. Yep. I forget what specific By the scripture gospel. that yep. is. Um, yep. So it goes sort of back and forth. And then it kind of takes a more theological turn. And I just want your quick thoughts on this, and then we'll we'll move on to the next thing. But uh, his response is, one of the responses was, well, my favorite book of the Bible describes 3,000 person churches with senior pastors. Mm -hmm. And the person responded, um, I contend so do a few other historians that the church in Acts was not actually a church ecclesia, but an event that was eventually scattered. Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts on that? That's, That's seemed, fine. That, yeah, I mean, yeah. obviously they're talking about on the day of Pentecost, Peter gets yep. to preach, 3,000 are saved. Um, you know, a short while after that, another couple thousand are saved. Mm -hmm. so you mm -hmm. seem to have a large Christian presence in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. um, they're gathering in in some sense. They're they're I mean, it, it says in Acts that they're meeting together in their homes and also mm -hmm. coming together in Solomon's portico. Is mm -hmm. it? So there's some kind of large gathering happening. I don't know how that, yep. you know, materialized. But um, I, I think I could kind of see both sides of that, um, of that discussion. But it, it, again, I don't see any New Testament limitation to keeping a church under 150 people. I think that's totally arbitrary. Um, I do think that there's a basis for... Uh, uh, churches that have strong eldership mm -hmm. and, or in their terminology, polycentric leadership. Right. So for example, the church in Jerusalem, you have the apostles. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. But Peter's kind of the leader. Right. And after Peter, it was James, the brother of Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, when Paul writes to Timothy, who's leading the church in Ephesus, which was believed to be quite a large church, mm -hmm. uh, Timothy's the leader. Right. And so you can have headship, you can have leadership, but mm -hmm. still have team. Right. Um, and so again, I think this person is drawing some conclusions that they just haven't thought through all the way. They're not necessarily biblical. They're kind of reactionary. Mm -hmm. Um, they're motivated by health, which I can appreciate. Right. Um, but I think they're, they're not trying to tear it all down there. No, yeah. I, but I think, well, they're going to, they're trying to tear it all down to 150. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah true. <laughs> true. It's kind of like, um, it's, it's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, getting rid of guns in America. It's like good, good luck, good luck, knocking door to door. Exactly. Good luck going church to church and getting all those pastors to just totally you disperse their yeah. congregation. Yep. Um, it's a silly suggestion, I think, but it, it seems to be, mm -hmm. you know, motivated by something. Do you ever healthy. think we, do you ever think we overthink these kinds of things? Sometimes I just find myself going, some people like big churches, and I'm glad there's big churches yes. that people like big churches can Absolutely. go to. And some people like small churches. Yes. And some people like I think it's I don't I just don't know that size 
has as much to do with it as we think that it does. Yeah, I think, I mean, I heard a great, a great quote. I was at um, a conference last week, you and I were mm-hmm. there together and uh, it was said that God doesn't measure churches, he weighs them. Mm-hmm. I really like that idea. And I do think there's something biblical about that in the sense that God is looking for maturity. Mm-hmm. Um, if a leader and a leadership team have the capacity to, to make mature disciples uh, at a larger scale than uh, somebody else does, more power to them. Mm-hmm. I think what's important is that big churches don't demonize small churches and small churches don't demonize big churches. Right. That to me is a really important thing. And we've missed that, I think, mm-hmm. um, at times. I think, uh, on, honestly, on both ends of the conversation, yeah. um, we can kind of, if you're smaller, you kind of trivialize mm-hmm. the big church, mm-hmm. you know, um, they're watering down, yep. blah, blah, blah. And in some instances, larger churches have not done a good job at making mm-hmm. disciples. But in a lot of instances, small churches haven't done a good job right. at making disciples. And so to me, it, it's, we're missing, we're having the wrong conversation. It's not about the number. Mm-hmm. How effective are we at doing what Jesus commissioned us mm-hmm. to do? And am I gifted and graced to do that at a certain scale? Is somebody else gifted and graced to do it at a different scale? Right. Wonderful. Right. Yeah. Let's celebrate all of it. Great. Love it.